All right. It is the week of February 28th, 2022, and this is the Fight Business Podcast. Today, we have a very important episode because we're going to talk about how the Russia-Ukrainian conflict affects the business side of MMA. And make no mistake, it affects it quite a bit. We're going to talk about how it affects individual promotions, how it affects fighters, how PR and optics for promotions will be handled, sponsorships, partnerships, all of that we're, go we're going to unpack. And then we're going to talk about mitigation strategies for those promotions on how they can navigate through this ever-changing situation. It's a very big deal. It's probably the first time in MMA we've had this type of scale of conflict that's occurred that will affect multiple promotions. So we need to unpack a lot of that and talk about what a business does when you know you have a political turmoil <laughs> across the globe. Uh, then we're going to do a UFC 272 pay-per-view by prediction. We're going to talk about Kayla Harrison re-signing with the PFL and PFL matching her Bellator offer. Was it the right call on PFL's part? I'll break that down for you. And lastly, we'll cap it off with financials of DAZN and Triller that we have not so rosy. They've got some work to do, but I'll break down what it means for both of those platforms. As always, we have the timestamps at the bottom. I'm still a little sick, so I might cough a little bit. We're going to do our best to edit that out. We'll see how it goes. But let's go ahead and dive right in. All right. So let's start off today's episode with the elephant in the room, which is the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. On a personal note, if you have any friends or family um, or live in Ukraine, um, my heart goes out to you and to the Ukrainian people. It's a terrible thing. Um, war sucks. Hopefully it is resolved very soon, peacefully. With that being said, how is this going to affect the business side of MMA? It's, it's going to affect a lot of things, right? Let's start with individual promotions. Um, if you're a big player in the MMA space, so I'm talking Bellator, PFL, UFC, one championship, you almost certainly have Russian fighters on your roster. Uh, probably some Ukrainian fighters too. If you're Bellator, you have a Ukrainian welterweight champion. If you're the UFC, you have several Russian fighters that are ranked in multiple weight classes and surging, right? Um, I, I mean, Alexander Volkov is supposed to headline a card in a couple weeks in London um, with m multiple other Russians on that card as well. It, it is a very big deal depending on how this situation unfolds. It's very fluid, but things continually are escalating. And as long as the conflict remains truly a conflict where, again, Russia doesn't necessarily take over Ukraine, Ukraine fights back for an extended period of time, the longer this draws out, the more damage it will do politically between nations and the more you can expect it to affect businesses because there will be increasing sanctions. There will be increasing public sentiment against certain actors in this conflict, right? In this case, Russia seems to be universally hated by everyone outside of Russia. There are a couple of sympathizers, sure, but for the most part, it's very much been the world against Russia and a couple, there are a couple of allies, Belarus, um, you have, you have some political tensions, um, between certain nations as well. But point being, this is going to affect your business. If you're an MMA promotion, there's no way around it. If you are, let's say Eagle FC, right? Habib, you've got the Kevin Lee, Diego Sanchez fight coming up soon. You're supposed to have it on U.S. soil. The newest economic sanctions have really hit the Russian economy hard. I mean, the ruble is down to just crater levels. Uh, Putin has signed a new declaration saying that you cannot take over $10,000 of foreign currency out of the country with you. Things are pretty dire for the Russian economy. You don't know exactly how Habib's money is is tied up, right? Um, but one would assume that he's being affected. And by default, Eagle FC will be affected. You have major players 
in Eagle FC who are connected to Ramazan Kadyrov. Habib is, to an extent, they have had a strained relationship recently, but you know what the extent of that strain is is unknown. Um, if you follow Kareem Zidane's work over at Bloody Elbow, he does fantastic work on covering all of this. It, it's hard to say where things lie with him and Kadyrov, but Kadyrov is is right now in the crosshairs of a lot of political figures and just he already had a bunch of sanctions before this conflict occurred that's why you had ACA not being able to have shows in the US it's only intensified um if you are ACA absolute championship akmat right um you now have your own roster fighters on your own roster boycott fighting there um you had a, a group of polish fighters essentially say you know we do not want to fight for ACA, we're not going to be a part of this. That's a big deal. You've got enough fighters in the Dagestani region and Russian region that you could probably get away with still hosting shows, but but still, it, it's going to be a big, big issue, especially with the no-fly zone in Russia, right? Or, or really no-fly list where several countries have canceled all flights to Russia. That's very, very big, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but individual promotions have to really decide how they're going to handle this <coughs> based on how they're effective. Um, you have Campbell McLaren coming out, I believe today on Twitter and saying that, you know, Russian fighters for combate may not be able to compete. Maybe just banned from competing until this is resolved. You've seen that on a larger scale with FIFA, you know, knocking out Russia from the World Cup qualifiers and the IOC um, basically banning Russia from any more Olympic activities. There is going to be increasing pressure from a political end on these MMA promotions. And it's going to be up to each individual promotion to handle that. A uh, Bellator again. You have Yaroslav uh, Amazov, I believe. Again, you know I'm terrible with names. <coughs> Sorry, still get still getting over the sickness. He is the current welterweight Bellator champion. He is defending Ukraine as we speak. What do you do if he he doesn't make it home? Or rather, he is home. He doesn't make it back, right? I hate to talk about that. Knock on wood, that doesn't happen. But that's a real possibility. So at this point, you, you've got to look at it from three major angles, in my opinion. If you are an MMA promotion, you got financing, right? Whether you are Eagle FC or ACA, <coughs> or you are really embedded <coughs> with um, everything going on over there, or you're just a promotion that has investments tied up in certain entities over in Russia, right? Like you may be the UFC or Bellator, and as part of your portfolio, you may have invested in certain assets or certain businesses or have sponsorships or partnerships over in Russia. That's almost certainly going to be cut off and you are going to be pressured to let go of it. And that's going to hit your bottom line, right? If you've got a deal, UFC has a deal with, with you know, uh, Russian TV to broadcast UFC fights. I talked about it um, in an article on the Body Lock that I believe you can still go see about how that was an aggressive market they were pursuing for quite some time. And they had broadcast deals there. I mean, at this point, does the UFC end that partnership, that broadcast deal? Do they wait? It's hard to say. You've got to make a financial call. UFC in particular is in this cost cutting. We've got to get as much money as possible to Endeavor. I would imagine they're going to remain more neutral than some of the smaller promotions in terms of their decisions. And it will only come down to another point we'll talk about here in terms of partnerships and relationships. If they get pressured hard on that end, they may end up cutting some sponsorships and things like that. But so you've got financing, right? How does it affect your, your bottom line? How does it affect your financials? 
the second part that any promotion needs to look at is how does it affect your fighters? It's going to be harder in a lot of cases to get fighter visas. Um, logistically, if any fighters are over in Russia, almost all of the, I, mean, I believe now, pretty much every European country and now the United States have banned flights to Russia, canceled all flights to Russia, which means if I'm Alexander Volkov, I need to get a flight from Russia to a different country and then connect and then get to London for the main event of UFC London on March 19th. That will become increasingly difficult. As economic sanctions hit Russian airlines, as they start to hurt the Russian economy, logistics are going to become more and more of a nightmare the longer this drags out. And so as that occurs, if I'm the UFC, if I'm Bellator, or whoever, whoever, and I need a particular fighter get to a fight, because let's say that they are, are important enough to be a fight, they're either going to be a main event, they're a rising contender. Let's be honest, the guys that are on the lower prelims are probably getting money and saying, hey, you've got to book your own flights and get over here and leaving them to figure it out, and they'll be just replaced and swapped in. But let's say, again, it's Volkov. I need to get, I'm Vol Alexander Volkov, I need to get to London by March 19th. I have to start planning out how to do that because flights I probably had direct to London are canceled. So not, now I have to figure out connections, all of that. And that raises costs because a lot of times the UFC will fly fighters and I believe just one coach and cornermen have to raise their own money um, sometimes, depends. But a lot of times the UFC will pay for that. So those costs are going up. That's going to hit your bottom line. Um, fighter visas is another huge thing, right? The UK just recently announced that they are ending uh, Belarusian and Russian sports teams visas. They're canceling them. Alexander Volkov came out with a statement yesterday, I believe, that said, you know, our visa is approved. We have it, but that's not the important thing. We need to focus on the conflicts. Who cares about my visas? Very classy of him and his team. Um, but there's a good chance that the UK could cancel his visa and then he cannot enter the country. And that main event is off. There's also a very high chance that if you a Russian you are a Russian fighter and you are slated to fight in the U.S. upcoming right in the next couple months, and you have to apply for your visa, that's just going to be slow roll. They might not outright say, "Hey, we are banning all Russian sports visas," but there's a very good chance that they will just take their time to approve it and may not approve it by when the fighters need, right? We've already seen visa issues kind of cause some havoc since we've had the administration change in 2020 for US, um, for people getting into the US, fighters getting into the US. That could easily become more of a problem. And you could have a passive aggressive, although they, you know, won't say it outright, hey, we're banning visas. You could have several agencies, but yeah, we're just gonna, you know, take our time dotting our I's and P's and Q's. And oh, you need this by when? Yeah, that's great. We're not fast tracking you. Get out of here. Right? Why not? The more that, that, you know, Russia and the United States tension grows, the more likely you have people within agencies and you have government agencies doing that. They could outright also say, you know, we're going to ban all sports visas and follow the UK's lead. That could easily happen. Then you have no chance of applying for a new visa and getting it. And you are just stuck over in Russia. And, and you know, from the UFC's perspective or Bellator's perspective, who have you, it's going to be hard if you're putting on international fights, right, to justify saying, all right, well, we need to have Volkov have a fight we based on his contract we have to offer him so many fights you know we need to have a volkov fight we need to go to russia to do this that's not that's not going to happen in this current climate now most likely it would be resolved by the time they would have a russian event anyway because of the schedule they need to plan so far out in advance but still it kind of makes things murky could always go back to fight island but again perception and pr depending on how this spins could be an issue. And that's the last big part of this is, is partnerships and PR.
if you're a promotion, you have to be very careful about what you say regarding this conflict. You have to, you know, navigate the minefield that is having Russian fighters compete for your promotion while much of the world is very upset with Russia. And you've got to be careful of partnerships because even again, if I'm Dana White and I don't care that this is all happening because I can almost bet money, you know, he, he might care about the conflict, but from a business perspective, he's not going to do anything. Neutrality is almost certainly what the UFC is going to go with here. Even if he feels that way and the UFC feels that way, remember they have a large broadcasting partnership with ESPN and Disney. So let's say Dana wants to move a bunch of fights to Fight Island to have this occur so that Volkov and, um, you know, Askar Askarov, all these guys, (coughs) (coughs) apologies, um, have to, you know, fight. Disney may shut that down or may, you know, ring, ring up the UFC and say, hey, we don't want you bringing these guys over here. And then what do you do? Right? Even just regular airlines, right? If they are <coughs> um, involved with a fighter that has ties to either Putin or Ramazan Kadyrov, it could become a liability for them. They won't want to deal with this. Hamzat Chemaev, obvious choice, right? He still is very much tied to Kadyrov. A lot of businesses don't want to risk, you know, being involved with Chemaev or being involved with somebody that is, is, at least from a public perception, very connected to Kadyrov right now. It could easily affect any sponsorships he has. It could, you know, cause some discomfort between sponsorships and relationships between the UFC and different partners they have. It's it's a big deal. We talked for weeks about how sponsorships were the new target of revenue growth in the UFC. That also means appeasement on the UFC's end for something like this because their sponsors will want to protect their brand big time. <clears throat> and anything that is a perceived threat to their brand or connection to supporting Russia at this point, no sponsor or partner is going to want. So that's another thing they have to navigate. That Those are the real big three categories, financial impacts, fighter impacts, and partnerships, sponsorships. PR, you can roll into that too. So that's what you're looking at. In terms of if you're an individual promotion, you've got to figure out how to navigate those big three areas that all have subset of problems that I've just talked about. And again, the longer this continues, the more of a, the more likely it will be that increasing tension and increasing economic sanctions will occur, escalation will occur. And if escalation occurs, you have a tightening, not just by political entities, but by public perception, I don't think it's going to reach, you know, the same type of fever pitch we've seen in previous global conflicts, but it hypothetically could. And and if it does, it becomes very tricky to navigate if you're a business that relies on Russian fighters, essentially Russian workers, right? So those are the big areas we've you've got to look at from a strategic point of view when you're talking about how this conflict affects the business of MMA. All right. So we've talked about the three big areas that you need to focus on. If you are a individual promotion that is again, involved in this, if you're a small regional promotion in you know, whatever country that's not Russia or Ukraine, or doesn't have those fighters from that area, those areas rather, you know, this doesn't apply, but again, about a bigger level here. Um, and KSW, I also should mention, right. Obviously they have elected to, um, cancel some of their bigger fights with Russian events. Um, they rely on, on Russian fighters too. So important to, to throw that out there because it is affecting a lot of promotions. So what do you do now 
to handle these three areas, right? Financial impacts, uh, fighter impacts, and and partnership sponsorship deals. Let's start with financial impacts. This is the definition, if you're a business, of a use of your rainy day fund, right? Not all businesses have that. If you're a particular individual MMA promotion, you probably don't have that. Um, UFC would. Bellator might have a small amount. Um, but but this is a rainy day scenario where you're going to have to eat some of these costs one way or another, whether it's offering fighters, um, you know, fights that and, and paying for their extra logistics and, and kind of, you know, making sure that you're good from a PR perspective, paying for PR, right? If you're going to go out in support of um, Ukraine and, and their people, you know, you've got to pay for video packages. You've got to kind of pay for some goodwill and show your support there. Uh, there's a lot of different impacts to your wallet if you're an MMA promotion. So you, if you don't have a rainy day fund, if you do, you're using it, right? And you're looking at ways to minimize cost and, and use what you spend effectively. If you're going to do a campaign that supports Ukraine and have, you know, a hashtag Bellator stands with Ukraine or stands with uh, Amazov or something or what have you, right? Which would make a little bit more sense, fit, focus more on the individual, put them on, um, you know, you have a couple of video packages, you maybe, you know, add some things to your site or, you know, do a brief announcement um, at the first event that you have um, post-conflict, like, that, that's the way you do it. And how much you want to dive into that space and put forth that type of marketing all depends on the reaction of your fans and your customers, as well as, you know, how deep do you want to go into those waters from a business perspective? Sometimes it makes sense to just kind of stay neutral and, and just say, look, all these things are happening. It's terrible. Have a brief you know, a press release or a statement and you say, okay, that's that. And you let it play out. MMA fans in particular, I'm sure they have opinions about this. Some stronger than others, but there probably is a solid amount of research that would back out or back up um, that, you know, MMA fans don't care that much. We've seen time and time again, political turmoil just in the U S occurring and, you, you have a couple of things happening with Dana White's personal relationship with Trump and all of that, but it hasn't affected too much people watching and purchasing fights. You don't have a, a large group of fans who said, man, you know, Trump is at UFC 244. I'm not watching. Or, you know, Trump is at UFC 244. I got to go. I got to watch. You didn't sway them. They had opinions about it, but it didn't affect their actual purchases. And if it doesn't affect your purchases, then you don't need to spend that much money addressing it in general, right? You need to protect yourself to make sure that you you are sending a clear message, but you don't need to go above and beyond where you may have customers turning off your product, not purchasing your product or, or going crazy and purchasing your product if you are supporting something that they're very involved in, right? What is the impact on variable purchasing power that this has. MMA fans, I'm going to say it doesn't have that much. I, I really don't think it will affect things from that regard. So it may make the most sense in a lot of cases, right, to essentially just not have Russian fighters compete anytime soon for your promotion. Um, if, if that's part of the logistical cost. If you have sponsorships where you are losing particular sponsors or because of economic sanctions or just perception, you've got to decide how much money through financial analysis, right? What is the, the impact on our goodwill? If we keep a sponsor with, let's say uh, a Russian entity that is, is being boycotted. And what is the you know impact if we lose that money and you, you do a basic ROI return there. In this case, if fans' purchases are not affected that much by the situation, as long as there's not an economic sanction where you could, you know, face, you know, federal inquiries if you're a U.S. business, um, or or 
whatever country's business, right? Where you're going to face some, some huge fines and all of that. You're probably keeping that sponsorship. You're not advertising it as much. You're kind of keeping it hush hush, but you're going to go ahead and keep it there. Um, or you're trying to work out a deal to put it on pause. I've seen that happen occasionally, not for this particular situation, right? Where you have a, a, a central war going on. But um, if you've had a company shakeup or a company issue where, you know, they may quietly move some things around and stop showing a particular logo. Um, if let's say there was a scandal in a particular company, maybe you remove the logo for a bit while things unfold and then you bring it back and it's kind of what have you. And, and you can work that out sometimes with partnerships. It depends, but usually comes at a cost, right? While you're not advertising their product or service, they're going to want compensation for that because they've have an agreement to pay you so that you do that. So it gets murky and, and it becomes an ROI calculation. What is the impact to our goodwill and perception of customers and new potential customers too, right? Even if your current customers are still going to buy your product or service or watch your MMA promotion, if you are supporting something that potential customers and that casual fans would really have an issue with, that also is something you need to take into account because you don't want to limit your bucket of potential customers. So you've got to do an ROI on all of that. And you've got to just kind of bite the bullet. You know, if you need to go get extra fund rate, you know, fundraising, if you're PFL or one to try and do extra fundraising rounds and say, look, this is a, you know, force majeure type of scenario where we've got this crazy conflict nobody could have seen coming. We need to raise some extra funds to bolster everything but we're still on track, blah, blah, blah. That, then you go out and you fundraise. And I'm sure PFL and one <coughs> are doing a little bit of that if they had major names of Russian fighters that, that they were going to, to, you know, sign and have compete, right? I, I don't think at the moment it's affecting them too much, but, you know, it could be an issue. If you're Bellator, you're, you know, essentially, you know, asking Viacom and CBS for – bit of money if again you actually are being affected that much but how much that's happening here is hard to say your biggest cost is probably going to be the logistics of getting fighters from russia to compete or essentially letting fighters go because and giving them the option to walk away because you can't offer them the fights that you're contractually obligated to if you're the UFC, there's probably some wiggle room in terms of offering a fight that a Russian fighter could not actually get to based on logistics. Depends. But you're going to have added costs here. You need to go in your rainy day chest. That's bottom line on that pretty much. Speaking of fighters and how you handle that, right? Fighter visas, uh, fighter costs. If you can't get the visas you need for fighters, then you have to essentially have those fighters on the shelf and either let them go or probably compensate them in some way based on the contract, right? You can't just have a fighter on your roster and then say, hey, you have to come fight. <coughs> <coughs> and, you know, they literally can't do it because of visa issues and say, oh, too bad. You just, you're still under contract with us. You can't go anywhere else. Now I say that, but based on the contract and the way it's worded, maybe they can, right? If they're the UFC, I wouldn't be shocked if contracts have the abilities to kind of lock fighters into that position. Um, if you're someone like Bellator, though, or Combate or, or PFL, this is a scenario where, you know, you work on, again, what makes sense to pay for the extra logistical cost and, you know, getting a fighter to where they need to be and helping to expedite visa costs and process and all that. But this is definitely a scenario where you probably say, look, we know this isn't your fault, but you, you know, you, you can go ahead and find other pr promotions, right? If you're, especially if you're those guys, if you're Bellator, if you're PFL, maybe you say, you know what, we can't help you, but I know there's regional promotions fighting uh, in Russia or, you know, go ahead and compete there, right? You, we'll let you, we'll, we will not stop you from competing on regional circuits so that you can get money. You can stay sharp, that type of thing. This is the time that you allow that. If you're a promotion, you say, you know what, go ahead and fight, fight for 
ACA probably not so much because of their ties to Kadyrov, but you know, fight for one of the many promotions in that region and and get paid. You probably allow that to happen. Um, you also, again, schedule fighters out as far as possible if they're from any of the regions affected in Russia. So if you're the UFC, Bellator as well, I would imagine. Um, PFL is a little bit different because of their tournament format. Format You're probably looking for a replacement. But if you're any promotion where you don't have particular events finalized yet, you pretty much take all of the Russian fighters and ex- hold off on scheduling them to fight as long as you can. So if there's a contractual obligation, you have to offer them a fight within this amount of time, right? You you wait up until the last possible event and try and schedule the fighter there. Would not be shocked <coughs> if <coughs> this situation resolves in, in the coming months and then in May or June, July, you see a or set Q2 and or uh sorry Q3 and beyond of this year you see a bunch of cards with a lot of of Russian fighters all stacked together for the UFC right that's what I would do I would say look we don't have to offer you a fight for a while or we have to buy this date we're going to find the last possible event date we can and schedule for that because hopefully by then tensions will have died down things will be back to normal or at least an uneasy peace or, or agreement will have been made that we're not having to deal with these extra logistical hoops and these extra costs and public perception, right? Hopefully things have died out enough that you're going to be able to come over as normal fight, get the visa that you need easily, all of that, and, and then go back. That's what I'm doing. If I'm any promotion right now where I don't have a finalized schedule. I am not scheduling any Russian fighters anytime soon. I'm waiting to the last possible moment. I mean, it just makes sense from so many ways. So that's what you're doing on the fighter side uh, between, again, giving them options to fight on regional promotions, waiting to schedule them. That's what you do. PR and partnerships and sponsorships, things of that nature. Um, Again, you're either going to be neutral here where you're not going to, come right out and say, look, we're neutral and we don't, you know, this conflict, you're not going to do that, but you're not going to necessarily highlight or address the conflict, right? You may just ignore it completely. Um, We saw this past weekend fighters individually made their statements, which they've always been allowed to do in the UFC, but you know, you didn't have a big video package saying like, look, we stand with Ukraine and all of that. At least not that I saw, I was watching the fights in and out though. So if I missed that, let me know. Um, But you're either, you know, doing that where you're just kind of not acknowledging it or you are coming out in support of Ukraine, you're doing a video package. If you're Bellator here, I think you do it for sure based on uh, Amazov's, you know, position in the company. Um, You you come out in support of him. You, you know, come out in support of all of that. You do it tastefully. You don't go overboard, right? Um, do the whole PR spinning fun wheel. If you are, if you're a smaller regional promotion, maybe you do a statement, something like that if you want, but you're, you're just being cautious because the one thing you don't want to do is come out too strong where you say, look, we're all behind Ukraine. Russia is terrible. Uh, Putin's a madman, all this stuff, make these strong statements that might affect and get a backlash from your Russian fighters. Cause you want them to still work with you in an ideal scenario, right? You hired them or um, rather contracted you didn't, uh, them for a reason. So you'd be, you'd be kind of tactful there and there's plenty of people that get paid a lot of money to do that. Uh, and then you either do one of those two, you're neutral or you show support for Ukraine. You do not show for Russia. If, if you show support for Russia, even if you, did as a promotion, want to show support. Um, Unless you are a regional promotion in Russia, if you do that, that is a death sentence. That is almost certainly going to cause a ton of blowback that you don't want. Um, And then you you carefully monitor and keep communication up with your partners and sponsors, right? Partners are being the big one. Sponsors and partners are very different in the sense that sponsorship, 
They are paying you to advertise a product. Partnership, they are paying you for a mutual ongoing agreement. It isn't just, hey, ESPN, we're going to go ahead and show our you know, uh, fights here and do all of that. It's, it's, yeah, there's, that is what you, you, ESPN is paying the UFC to do, right? That's what Showtime is paying Bellator to do, but it's an ongoing relationship that will, for both parties, ideally, but especially for the promotion side, they'll want to maintain. It's not a crypto.com gave you millions of dollars for you to put crypto.com on your shirt. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and do that. And at the end of this, maybe we'll re-up, maybe we won't, whatever. This is a key partnership where that broadcast, you know, those broadcast rights rather are crucial to your business succeeding and getting your revenue to grow. Last thing you want to do here is come out of this the wrong way, make a PR gaffe and cause strife between you and your partner. <clears throat> and that means communicating with them and letting them know if you're doing even the slightest thing that they may perceive as being an issue, you are in constant contact with them. And keep in mind, that's kind of a normal drill when a company goes through a, a scandal or some issue, right? You are calling up your partners, your sponsors, um, and, and making sure they're happy, getting their view on everything, understanding that relationship. You have people that are hired and paid just to maintain those client and partner relationships, right? Um, but partners are the big ones in MMA because if, especially if you're a smaller promotion, right? If, if you're Combate and you somehow piss off Univision, right? You're, you're screwed. Um, you, there are a lot of nuances and you and there are a lot of assumptions you can't make. You need to be in constant communication. So that's that's what you're doing if you're promotion from that side. Uh, if you feel pressure, right, from a part to or or a big paying sponsor to not have certain fighters fight, to not talk about certain things on your broadcast or highlight certain fighters, so on and so forth, you have to make the decision. <coughs> You've got to look at the ROI again. It always comes back to ROI. What does it cost us if we let this fighter go and they become a champion at a different organization and become a huge star? <coughs> Do we even really believe that's going to happen? What does it cost us in terms of sponsorship money if our partner Disney doesn't want us to show this Russian partner who has paid us a ton of money to highlight their product? What do I do? <coughs> Usually partners are always going to take priority, but, but you've got to look at it from a true ROI perspective. And there will be contract language in there, you know, that lawyers will be looking at. That's another cost of all this. Um, having your legal people review certain decisions you'll make. But communication goes so far. I have, in almost every place I have consulted for, the more communicative you are during a crisis, even if a partner, like, if it's a crisis that you cause or a scandal that is on you, the more communicative you are with your partners and sponsors, the better it usually ends up. They might be pissed at you. They may, you know, fundamentally disagree with you on a bunch of it or in a bunch of decisions or actions you've taken. But the more you talk to them and are able to at least have those conversations, the better off you are. So that's something you're doing here. If, if you are, you know, some of these global partnership and global brand ambassador guys at the UFC, I bet you are, you know, on the phone constantly, especially if you've got partner, you've got a region in Russia that you're trying to handle right now. I do not envy those guys. Those guys are probably working nonstop. Communication, judging your PR and how customers are going to affect, that's how you handle that aspect of things. So again, <clears throat> quickly to recap and again apologize for the coughing is for financing and financial issues rainy day fund or fundraising for fighters you're scheduling them as far out as possible and then you're doing an roi in terms of how it affects your financials do you want to let them go uh do you pay the extra cost to get them there if they're high ranked and they're in a contender you know or might be a potential star 
put a lot of money into them. You're evaluating all of that. And then for PR and sponsorships and partnerships, again, you're, you're being very careful with your PR here. Either going neutral or showing support for Ukraine, you are constantly talking to sponsors and partners about your decisions and things that decisions you make that could be perceived in a bad light, um, both to the general public and mainstream media, as well as to each other and um, your particular partnerships. And, and you are evaluating and doing an ROI, um, you know, internally about hard decisions about when it comes to particular sponsors or deals and partnerships and sponsorships, you may lose some, right? You may end up having to lose some sponsors to keep a valuable partnership or vice versa. You may have to lose a partnership to keep a very valuable sponsorship. It's, it's an evaluation. It's a lot of management of relationships. It's a lot of perception tactics, optics, and, and making sure that, you know, again, as the public and as your customer base is changing their views about the conflict, because that will happen over time, you are keeping a, a pulse on that. Because if your customers start to be like, we hate Russia, we don't want any Russian fighters in the MMA space, I don't want to see somebody, I'm not buying a single thing that has a, a Russian you know, I'm not buying a single pay-per-view or buying going to a single event that has Russian fighter on it. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I very much doubt that will. But if that happens, right, if that did happen, rather, you would need to have your pulse on your customer base because you don't want to alienate them. Both your hardcore, your your semi-hardcore, your prospective potential customer base. You've got to keep in line with that. Got to be careful there. So those are your main mitigation strategies for this entire conflict. Um, let me know your thoughts on this. Big shout out to my father, actually, Vincent Auger, who is a professor of political science over at Western Illinois University. He helped, you know, um, give me some insight on this because he has a lot of foreign policy background. Super smart dude. Smartest person I know. Um, so, you know, shout out to him. But let me know your thoughts on this entire situation. If it makes sense to you, it, am I missing something here? Do you? Is there some perceived thing that you're worried about that may happen, right? Um, thoughts and concerns and, and just overall about how this might affect the business of MMA. I'd love to talk more about it. Um, going to stay on the business side, not get into the personal, you know, moral end of it. But if you have questions on this, let me know because it's in an important development. This is the first time that MMA has really been through this type of global conflict. Other sports have dealt with this before, right? A lot of other sports, there's been some major war or some major, you know, global conflict that has, has caused some issues. This is MMA's real first foray into that where it's affecting on a large scale, their fighters and some of their promotions and deals and things of that nature. So let me know your thoughts on all of that. Would love to hear. That. All right. Talked about the big thing for today. I'm going to go through these other ones quickly because as you could tell, I'm still coughing up a storm and I'm sure you guys just love hearing me cough into the mic. You know, I'm sure that's just a fantastic experience for you. Um, so let's let's just drill through these next couple topics pretty quickly. And for the record, I know sometimes I say I'm going to be quick and then I kind of drag on. I'm going to make it a point to be quick about this. So UFC 272 pay-per-view by prediction. <sighs> I think this is an interesting one because... Had you done Colby versus Masvidal, you know, even a year ago, I think there would have been a lot more interest. Now you have both guys coming off of pretty bad losses to Kamaru Usman. Um, would have made a lot of sense to have Colby in that close fight with Usman fight Jorge. Uh, instead, you have, you know, Jorge being knocked out by Usman in his last outing and, you know, Colby being soundly beat by Usman this time around, it does kind of take a little shine off of it, right? And yes, they've got the bad blood and all this, you know, we were friends and now we're not and all this, but it, a lot of that beef kind of had been hot past couple of years. It's, it's kind of simmered. And now it's, it's yes, starting up again through the trash talk and all of that. And I still do believe Masvidal has drawing power despite his, um, you know, loss to Usman. Um, 
probably diminishing some of that, but still. It's tough to say. When you look at the, the metrics that we have here, um, social media metrics, engagements, things like that, there's still a fair amount of interest. I think that's mostly Masvidal, but it, it doesn't seem to be on the scale that you would hope, although that's coming from a hardcore fan, right? Um, key thing to remember with, with pay-per-views is that we as hardcores might be like, eh, I don't really want to see this. I kind of know how this is going to go. But a potential perspective pay-per-view buyer is like, oh, Colby Masvidal. They might they might have not even thought about Colby Covington or Jorge Masvidal since the last time they both fought Usman. And now you've got a hype package saying, man, like these guys are, you know, former title challengers and they were best friends and now they hate each other and you've got the trash talk. It can reel them in. So I'm going to go, I think it's going to be lower, especially you've got the pay-per-view price as high as it is. Um, I think you're going to see more hardcore fans sail in the high seas probably than you did at UFC 271. Um, I think I'm going to go 400,000. I think Masvidal still has enough shine. He'll he'll pull that 400 to 500K. I doubt it goes above that. Could be less, but I, I'm going to go 400,000 based on what I'm seeing um, in terms of Masvidal's drawing power. But then you add in the, the extra price. Yeah, I'm going to go 400,000 on this one. I think that's probably a safe bet, but we'll see. And we'll see if we get numbers. We haven't gotten any numbers from UFC 271 that are accurate. I see numbers out there. They're just not true. Um, again, had to talk about it with the New York Times. That's ridiculous. But yeah. Um, so my... I'm, I'm going to go 400,000 on this one. Let me know your thoughts. Do you think it'll be... Over, under, I know you guys had some strong thoughts about UFC 271. I love that. And, you know, love to hear differing opinions. So let me know how you think this one goes. I'm going 400,000. That's my guess. All right. Next up, PFL has matched Bellator's offer to Kayla Harrison, and Kayla Harrison has re-signed with the PFL. She tweeted out that she was very frustrated, um, quite possibly because, again, it's not really her call. If in her contract she had a matching clause – which it sounds like that's what's happened here. She was probably trying to go to Bellator to fight Cyborg to kind of, you know, become a, a bigger, you know, star, hopefully become a bigger fish in a bigger pond, right? Uh, and PFL said, nope, we're going to match that offer and you're going to sign right back up, which for Kayla isn't the worst outcome, right? You're probably going to make a ton of money. We still don't know how long the PFL has in terms of runway. We know they're not profitable, but, um, you know, who knows how long they'll be around and how many more opportunities Kayla will have to make a million dollars. And she should seemingly be able to breeze through the competition to make a million dollars pretty easy this year. So we'll see. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting call for a lot of ways. Um, not what I would have initially expected. I didn't expect the UFC to make a great offer once Nunez lost. Again, you had White publicly saying that was the super fight to make after Nunez got submitted by Pena. Um, and Harrison in the crowd being upset. She had been brought up to the front, presumably to go into the cage and have a you know, stare down. That all got you know blown up. So not shocked the UFC kind of kept that offer low because, again, it took a lot of the shine out of that match. So Bellator making the offer makes, again, a lot of sense because you got Cyborg versus Harrison, which would be a huge fight. PFL matching it? Is it the right call for them? I say yes, because Harrison is by far their biggest homegrown prospect, right? Their best homegrown star. She is the face of the PFL, not only in the women's division, but of the PFL in general. Um it's not to the same scale, but again, like imagine you don't have the Conor McGregor. All you have is Ronda Rousey. <coughs> you don't even have John Jones because he's in the hit and run stuff. Ronda Rousey is kind of the face of your organization, and then she jumps ship to Bellator. It's, that hurts you if you're the UFC. It's, it's a much smaller scale than that, but same type of deal. Kayla Harrison is the face of that organization. She's only getting as much attention as she has because of what she's been able to do in PFL, and again, not against the best competition, but they've been pushing her and marketing her, and that's 
made PFL much more relevant than if she was gone. So I think it makes sense for PFL to match the offer. It's the smart play here. You're not going to be able to hold on to Kayla forever. Eventually that contract will run out. And she, if she's, you know, voicing that she's frustrated right now, it could easily be because she's frustrated because um, she didn't want to fight in PFL. She was, was definitely testing free agency. Right. <coughs> so, um, I think it's the right call of the PFL here to match that offer. And, you know, Harrison will probably dominate the competition again. But if you're the PFL and you're trying to continue to grow this, you need to have kind of an anchor star that everything circulates around. And right now, Harrison is that anchor. And much better to go with the anchor you know than to lose her and try and put somebody else in that role and maybe they don't succeed the way you want, right? Clarissa Shields is obviously someone they're trying to build towards that, but she lost her last fight out. She has a lot of issues um, to tackle still on the grappling side. So, I, I mean, not shocked here that PFL matched the offer. It is the right call from a business perspective. Um, Going to go back to doing fundraising rounds, going to try and continue to make more deals and sponsorship deals. Uh, you need a face for that. Kayla Harrison is a tried and tested face that can work for the PFL for that. So the right call here, PFL did the right thing by matching the offer. All right. Last thing to talk about here on the podcast for today, DAZN and Triller Financials. Uh, DAZN did file their accounts for the end of 2020. Losses totaled, $1.3 billion, which is about the same as it was last year. Net liabilities totaled over $1 billion. Um, big thing here is that they've done some recapitalization. And uh, this is all from, by the way, shout out to Chris Williamson uh, on Twitter, who, had, who has a great thread about this. Um, but they've now recap done some recapitalization um, and let access which is, is a company that they borrowed from before has lent another 1.05 billion to the company uh, and 1.1 billion after the year end to fund operating activities. And the loans have an interest of 30%, which is crazy high. Um, customer numbers weren't reported. Uh, they did report that UK revenue comprised only 5% of total revenue, um, future commitments to rights holders for $5 billion. All in all, what this means is they need to become very profitable very quickly. Uh, at least need to be in much better shape than they are right now. That that you know, DAZN was hailed when they had the Bellator deal. When they were they had Canelo, they were really trying to make a play, as I stated on this podcast as well as some articles. Uh, for sure, dog, you can go back and look up. They had made a big bid to become the next major sports streaming platform. This was really as ESPN plus was in its infancy or not even around yet, they were trying to be the streaming service for sports. They were looking to make major rights bids for things like football and baseball in the U S um, things that would have kind of established them as the premier sports streaming league that has not gone well for them. They have, have kind of failed in that regard. Uh, they tried with combat sports. You had Canelo, you had, you know, um, several big names and, and in MMA you had Bellator and KSW for a little bit, I believe it, it's really not panned out the way they wanted. And now they've got a ton of debt. They are losing money at a very bad rate. And there's no real hope in my opinion, that they're going to be able to land some of these larger rights deals when they do come up um, for negotiation. Uh, at this point, they're looking pretty pretty rough. Conversely, you have Triller, who this is more of a rumor. It's not not you know um, confirmed financials from what I have, but it was from Dave Meltzer, right? Where Triller lost eight hundred eleven million dollars in twenty twenty one. Meltzer stating that Ryan Kavanaugh is extremely good at getting people to give him money and extremely good at losing that money. But Triller is in a different position in the sense where they're still relatively new. That those are massive losses, but they've really they're they're due to acquisitions of things like Fight TV and Versus, right? Which are, are popular platforms. That's more of a a heavy losses and heavy debt type of startup scenario. 
that is doing rapid M and A and and really trying to mergers and acquisitions and and really trying to make a a big statement through their fundraising that they'll eventually turn profitable. Um, mentioned this on the podcast last week. It's it's similar to a lot of these unicorn companies like Uber and Lyft and and so on and so forth, where they're they're even Endeavor to an extent, right? Uh, before Endeavor had the UFC unprofitable and were just buying companies up left and right. Had a ton of bad debt, was looking, eh, not great. Only reason they turned a profit was they got the UFC, but they did turn a profit. And they are now seemingly getting the money to fund some of those entities that they hope to make eventually profitable and create that ecosystem, right? So it's... Not great that they lost eight hundred eleven million dollars, right? Of course, but I'm less concerned about Triller than I am DAZN. DAZN's been around a while; they've made some bids for big plays. It has not gone well. Triller, on the other hand, is still surging, is still making acquisitions, looking to make plays at different, you know, fighters. You just had BKFC, um, you know, getting a majority stake being bought out. They're still doing the MA dance. If that continues for another year or two, well, then you're in trouble. But right now, you still have a lot of, of pockets you can go to for angel investors, for VCs, what have you. And you have a lot of good assets you can show and a vision, a strong vision that you can present that will get a bunch of money from a lot of investors. They will look at it as a unicorn and say, yes, I see this vision. I see what you're going for. Here's $100 million. That's how startup funding works, fundraising works. If you can convince them of the vision, you can get the money. Talked about this a couple weeks ago. So, um, yeah, DAZN, eh, trouble. Very big trouble. Triller, not great, but less worried given where they are as a company right now. All right, everybody, that wraps up another episode of the Fight Business Podcast. Thank you so much for watching. If you're on YouTube, make sure you hit the like, subscribe, bell notification button. If you are on uh, Spotify, Apple, Anchor, what have you, podcast, I appreciate you listening. I know I have... It has been drawn to my attention uh, that a couple people have said that episodes are missing, I believe, from Apple. I'm double-checking a couple things uh, to see where they are. I will work on resolving that, hoping that this one is up there. Uh, if it's not, I'm sure I'll talk to you uh, for the people that have let me know. But apologize if you haven't seen a couple of episodes for a while. I will try and get this one as well as the previous episodes that are missing on those platforms. Mind, I'm going to go take some cough medicine and probably take a nap. But you guys get money.